Okay, Dr. Karen McNamara, go ahead and tell us about sample challenges. Okay, um, thank you guys for having me here. Uh, I, people tell you I love and love to talk about this stuff all the time. So uh, I have a lot of slides here. We're going to go through pretty quick, but I think you'll have a little bit of time to ask some questions. So that's your mic. Okay. And where does my? I right here. Okay. All right. Uh, well, I think uh, I missed the beginning of Keiko's, but I think she talked about a timeline of sample return and talked about our going to the moon, which is, of course, our first sample return, but very different because obviously we had people there to select the samples, to pick them up package them to bring them back. Uh, but the thing that is common about those and the sample returns that we do is that when we bring back those samples, uh, we have a lot of opportunity to do work on them. Uh, and the lunar samples, in fact, are still being studied very actively today. And some of the things that we're able to do are, uh, for example, when we get an anomalous result, we don't we did not think the moon was made out of cheese, yet there it is in front of us. Well, we can, we can use a lot of techniques, maybe things we hadn't even thought of, to look at that and find out what really is there. Uh, we can also, when we have two answers that don't match, we can think about a third technique, a fourth technique. So we have a lot of opportunity. And that allows us to explore a lot further because I'm sure Jackie has said before that every time you answer a question, it means you have five more. <laughs> and so having these samples still here, people today can look at the questions that they answered that gave them more questions and go on and try to answer those. So uh, the unmanned missions that we've done to date are Genesis and Stardust. And I'll start with Genesis because that was the first one. And this is my basic, this is what the mission is. Essentially, there is solar wind, ionized particles coming from the sun all the time. And we wanted to collect it. So what we did was stick a spacecraft that I'll talk a little bit more about. This is just a schematic. Uh, with lots of collectors out in front of the sun. And we let it sunbathe there for a while in order to collect enough material for us to detect. And the reason we want to know about the sun is that for any theory of the solar system, well, the sun is sort of the starting point because it's 99% or more of the entire mass of the solar system. So we ought to know what that is before we start to predict how the other things came about. Uh, and you think about, everybody says, how do you collect the sun? <laughs> All right. Uh, and it doesn't matter how old you are. Little kids ask. Big kids ask. <laughs> Um, and it's harder than you think, and it's easier than you think. The reason that we can't do it on Earth is because the Earth has this big magnetic field, and that deflects all of these particles. A very good thing for us, but not a very good thing for study, studying solar wind. So we have to get outside of that magnetic field. Okay? So we need to be somewhere between here and the sun where that magnetic field ends. Well, compared to the distance to the sun, that's not that big. And in fact, what we did do was go to the point where the gravitational field of the Earth and the sun balanced, because that meant it cost very little energy to stay there. It's kind of you're at the perfect balance point. But if you look at this chart on the bottom, that's only a million miles away. So it's only 1 93rd of the way to the sun. So think about the size of those gravitational fields and the size of those bodies. Keep going. I talked about collecting it in ultra-pure materials. And these are actually the hexagons of, uh, they're about 10 centimeters point to point, And they're made up of silicon, germanium, uh, sapphire, gold on sapphire, diamond. Uh, you think, why do we use such expensive materials? It's not because they're expensive. It's because they're pure. These are some of the few materials that we can get in a pure form. So let's keep going. We take those trays. Now we have these big trays of different collectors. And we use different collectors because we want to uh, detect different atoms or different atomic species. And we stack those up and put it in a canister that's internal to the spacecraft. What you see in the gold 
circle there, that tiny disc in the middle, is a two and a half inch collector. And that has four quadrants made up of silicon carbide and diamond. And those are actually were the most important thing on the spacecraft. So we close that all up, put the canister inside a capsule. We keep going. We put the capsule on top of a spacecraft, and what you see there, the uh, wings there, are the solar panels that are going to come down when it's in space. Uh, and put that inside the fairing of a Delta II rocket. And on August 8th of 2001, we launched. So when Genesis is in cruise phase, that is, it's on its way out to that gravitational balance force, or it's on its way back, this is what it looked like uh, without the passengers. <laughs> okay, and then the next picture shows you what it looked like when it was at that balance point. This is when it's open, and I said it was sunbathing, and if you look at it, it really is sunbathing. All those collectors are just out there in the sun for 24 plus months. Our minimum collection was 24 months. And uh, you can see every bit of space we used, the lid of the canister, the lid of the capsule, everything's got a sample on it. So our exciting day was about three years later, September 4th, uh, it's, excuse me, September 8th, 2004. It was a Wednesday. And it was about 1030 when we were supposed to come in. And you remember that trajectory that I showed you? If you saw, we went a long way out of our way to come back. And the reason that we did was if we came directly back from the sun, we would have come in at night and it's hard to see a parachute at night. So what we did was a flyby of the moon, very similar to the Apollo 13 movie when they do a flyby so that they can minimize their energy and come home. Well, that's what we did. So, uh, and these guys are good, by the way. In every single practice, the uh, helicopter pilots never missed catching the parafoil. So if you go on. On September 8th, however, there was no parachute. Uh, spacecraft came in beautifully, exactly where it was supposed to be, exactly how it was supposed to come in, until the part where the drogue chute didn't open and then the parachute didn't come out, which meant that the spacecraft, or the capsule rather, uh, hit the ground at 200 miles an hour or more. Um, and you think about it, if you see this, this capsule's coming in and it's rotating and it's mutating and it's amazingly compact. There's no debris field there. And that is because the Utah mud that that landed in is one of the most viscous materials on Earth, or rather, least viscous materials on Earth. It is it just locked it in instantly. Uh, good in a way for collecting bad in another way. But we did have plans for what happens if. So if you go on. The first what happens if was we built a clean room, a very large clean room that would allow us to do all the work we needed to do if we had the canister open and if we had to open samples and package them individually and take them back. So we had this large clean room that we built out there. We also had at least 20,000 separate containers clean and barcoded in the event that we had to use them. Okay, so to keep going, we of course did have to use them. And here you see that in fact the canister was breached, not just the capsule. And you see me pulling out some very large samples that were easy to get at. But really most of them were so small and so difficult to get at uh, that we couldn't do anything in the field. The next one. Uh, what we had to do then, the bottom of the canister had actually been sheared off. And so in order to contain as many samples as we could and get them back in the best shape we could, we actually had to turn that canister over onto the lid and use the lid to catch the material. Go on. Uh, and then our, our greatest job was to work to get all of this done and back in the clean room by nightfall. But one thing that you see is these are the concentrator targets I told you about. Three out of the four of them were perfect. And the one that was left, we still had a substantial amount of that material. Go on. 
but bringing it back upside down was a little bit of a problem later because the mechanism that held those arrays then had to be dealt with upside down. And so we had to make a rig where we could lay on the floor, take the pieces off, then take each tray one at a time off and do the next tray. Okay, so this is gonna be hard to see for some of you, but the point is we started out with 308 collectors and by the time we left Utah a month later, than we were supposed to, we had over 10,000 individually packaged pieces. Uh, but because, remember, this is a sample return mission, we can work on these and we can do things we never expected to do. And it's taken us a long time. We thought we'd have the good results in two years, and it probably took us seven. But we have achieved 100% of the mission goals. You go to the next one quick. The biggest thing that we found out is that all our theories told us the oxygen and nitrogen isotopes in the sun and on the earth should be the same. And they are not. Which means start over again. We need some new theories. But that's a pretty amazing thing because remember when I said you start you come up with a question, you still have samples here to investigate that question further. So I can stop here and uh, are we are we ready for some questions? Thank you, Karen. Uh, is there someone who has a question here? Sherry, you, you, all right, go go again. Could you give us a little bit more information about the isotopic differences? Um, well, what we did actually in order to measure the isotopic differences, what we're interested primarily in is oxygen 18, 17, and 16. It's really 17, which is the tiny, tiny, tiny one that we're going for. This is why they have to be so clean. If we got a little bit of background oxygen in there, we're in trouble. So what we used to measure oxygen were silicon carbide 13 and diamond labeled with 13. And the reason is that at C13017, we have a unique mass signature. And that allowed us to, to look at that. And in fact, Genesis put, the mission itself, put money into developing instruments ahead of time that we knew we wanted to exist when we came back. That was a major thing missions had never done before. But we knew we didn't have the capability when we launched to do what we knew we wanted to do when we got home. And so uh, Dr. Captain McKeegan was funded to put together an instrument called a Megasims. And that allowed us to do this. And what he was looking for again was that 017 C13 signature. Uh, now the difference in the isotopes of the sun and uh, other bodies uh, has to do, and I'm not a solar physicist, so I will summarize this in the simplest and slightly incorrect way, uh, but has to do with the accretion of the planets and how they formed, the temperatures at which they formed, um, because you get different fluxes of material based on weight at different temperatures. Um, and so it was thought that the inner bodies, which formed obviously rocky bodies, solid bodies, would be different than the outer bodies and would be closer to what the sun's composition was. And that doesn't seem to be true. Actually, the data that we have on Jupiter matches the sun better. <laughs> so it's certainly not what we thought, um, but I can't tell you why. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, this year at the Genesis Science Team meeting, for the first time, um, a large part of the participation was, were solar physicists because now that we have real data that they can work with, they're really excited to get in and start to look at the theories and how they're gonna to start to explain this. Okay. And I should mention too that Stardust adds to that equation. We have some questions from other sites. Um, Whitney, are you going to, um, to do the switching and, and asking questions at other sites? Sure thing. 
So um, again, people can ask questions of either uh, Karen or Keiko. And um, our next site would be uh, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. Applied Physics Lab. Uh, hello, this is uh, Mohit from uh, JPL. I'm sorry, from uh, APL. Um, in addition to getting the radiation from the sun, uh, are there any plans to get equivalent uh, samples from some of the gaseous planets? Uh, no, the only data that data. we have from the gaseous planets is remote sensing. Because they do not radiate anything, is that why? Uh, we have uh, remote sensing missions. Uh, the only sample return missions we have at this point are uh, the lunar sample return missions by both the U.S. and the Soviet Union, uh, Stardust, Genesis, and soon to be OSIRIS-REx. 